What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to a great episode of Lockdown Badgers. We got the man, John Garcia Jr. on to talk about the recent commitments, plus a speedster of a running back that Wisconsin's high on. We're going to talk about all that and more on a recruiting edition of today's Locked On Badgers. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Lockdown Badgers, your team every day. One of your first listens every day. Really do appreciate it. We're going to get right into it. I'm your host, Ryan Herrings. As always, we have Locked On's football recruiting insider, John Garcia Jr. on. John, we got we got news to talk about again. Like, this is fun. It's always fun. First of all, it's always fun to have John on, but especially coming off a couple commits. John, let's start here. Uh, I want to start with Thomas Heiberger, 6'4", 220-ish pound uh, linebacker out of Sandy, or Sioux Falls. Big athletic kid. What did you like about or what did you see about his game when you watched him on film? Yeah, obviously works primarily as as a pass rusher there uh, in South Dakota. And why not? Right. Six, four athletic uh, over 215 pounds or so. You understand why uh, in high school they're like, hey, let's get after the passer and, and, and be productive there, which he, he very much is. I, I was really impressed with the football IQ, the hands, the technique that he plays with. I think there's a lot of natural ability. He's strong off the line. When he does move to linebacker, the read and reaction skills are really strong when he does play off the ball or even as a stand-up player there on, on the edge. But uh, that combination of of awareness and IQ and understanding of where he's supposed to be is really solid. It's kind of clinical out there. Uh, he attacks the outside shoulder of the offensive tackle and then works from there. If he beats him with speed, uh, he wins. If not, he counters with great hands and lateral ability. So I think there's a lot to like about the pass rushing ability and, and the floor um, there athletically with, with his football IQ attached to it. We, we don't get as many samples of him working off the ball, but that looks productive as well. Whether he works outside in, even drops into coverage a little bit with some success, I do think there's some potential three down ability just depending on where Wisconsin wants this kid. You know, I think he's got the frame to where you could bulk him up and say, hey, rush the passer permanently at 240 pounds, or you could push him off the football and allow him to be an extension of your defensive line, help to set the edge as a second level player. I could see that in his wheelhouse down the line as well, but he's got physically some blank slate to work with, but in between the lines on, on Friday nights, there's, there's a high floor here with what he does well today. Yeah, you know, one of the great stories I heard with with Thomas is uh, Texas A&M is one of the schools that offered him. He's kind of blown up recently. Yeah, you know they said we got your your metrics, your athletic testing numbers. Just can you film? Can you film yourself doing that so we can verify? Uh, you know he's an outside linebacker, has a, a thirty nine inch vertical, four six forty. Um, with the, some of the testing numbers that he has here. Um, when we talk about athletic measurables per position, right, I think we have a good feel. Receivers, we want them running a 4-3-4-4, a four, 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 right? What about a linebacker running a 4-6 with a, almost a 40-inch vertical with that frame? Yeah, w- with that frame, that's the key part. I, I think if this was, a, you know, a 6-foot, 220-pound downhill type of player, uh, you're happy with it for sure. Um, but it, it just means a little bit more when you, you look at 6'4", 215 on there with these numbers. You say, oh, and now it becomes very noteworthy because you can utilize him as a true speed edge rusher or, or keep him there at the second level. He is fast enough, clearly, and explosive enough, which is the measure of that vertical jump, uh, to where he can absolutely play almost anywhere on the edge in the front seven. You know, first level, second level, he could play off the football if you need him to. And you should feel comfortable there. Uh, and we again, we get samples of all of that on Friday nights, which is just as important, if not more important. So I just think he creates again, he creates a blank slateness to him to where his body can develop in, in one of two ways. And you're kind of OK with it in, in either way. If he if he's a full time pass rusher or a true off the ball player, you're, you're fine with it there, because if you think of the modern game and what you have to combat, the offensive tackles are getting longer and, and smaller, right? So they're built to combat the, the Thomas Highburgers of the world. And then you look at the second level, running backs are getting more fluid. These tight ends are getting freakier, right? We talk about it all the time on, on this show. This is the type of player that could potentially help you combat 
some of that, whether it's with his physicality at the line of scrimmage or even running underneath and presenting a smaller target window for the quarterback. So I, I think there's a lot to work with here, depending on how Wisconsin views him when he does get there for good. Uh, but, of course, he's got another year to, to bulk up or whatever his body's going to do that will uh, present itself uh, a year from now. And I think Wisconsin could even tweak the evaluation at that point. But it's a good problem to have when you're you're bigger and more athletic than most. Let's talk about that bigger, more athletic than most. Um, uh, that, that's not a huge football recruiting hotbed, sure. you know, South Dakota. What what type of competition is he playing there? And, and who are the type of schools that would go in? Is that, that typically like a Nebraska, Iowa? Uh, who goes into South Dakota typically there? Yeah, typically it's it's that part of, of Big Ten country that goes in for the upper echelon. We've seen, obviously, the Dakotas prelude well to the FCS level with, with the Bison up there and, and their crazy run of championships. But every now and again, you know, we get something different. You know, and I think that's what, what Thomas has been able to, to present himself as because he is a unique athlete on top of it. Just like Lincoln Keenholz last cycle – when you bring uniqueness and overall athleticism to this physically dominant Friday night player, it, it pushes you beyond that conventional geographical footprint uh, from a recruiting standpoint. So you do get the SEC involved. Some of the Big 12 gets involved a little bit more, and it becomes a, a little bit more national of a recruitment. And that's what we, we started to see here with Thomas as well, with that great example you threw in there uh, about a and &M. So, um, yeah, typically not a hotbed, and he's dominating competition that he probably should dominate, but he is. you know, And, and that's always been my deal with, with small school guys. Derrick Henry played on the border of Florida, Georgia, in a tiny town, 1A football, but he kicked their ass every time. You know, so it's, it's like all he did was set the new rushing record in the history right. of high school football. So – if you're going to be the biggest, freakiest guy, it should look like it on Friday nights. And we get a lot of that with, with Thomas Heiberger, again, whether he's rushing the passer or not. No, that's great stuff, man. And I think that's a that's a really good point of you can't control your competition at some point, right? Not every player changes high school. Some certainly do, but some don't. You just got to look the part at that point. And that's something that certainly Heiberger does. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about another linebacker commit with John. Um and I, there's an interesting parallel between the two of them I want to ask John about. We're going to talk about that next on Lockdown Badgers. But first, today's show brought to you by our good friends over at Built Bar. Um, I've been all about Built Bar for a long time. I've talked about it. Delicious snack, but you don't want to taste. It doesn't want to taste like it's it's healthy, but it is healthy. That's the key, right? You want healthy food that tastes like McDonald's. It tastes like fast food. It tastes delicious. And that's what Bill Bar is. It, it is 100% pure chocolate, lots of protein, low sugar, something to keep you going, something to keep you healthy, fuel your, your muscles, um, healthy, and they taste amazing. And I don't know how they do it. Honestly, it's unbelievable. It's the best tasting protein bar on the market. They come in unbelievable flavors, churro, peanut butter, brownie, cookies, and cream. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but they continue to do it. And you no longer have to wait for a box to be delivered. They've gone mainstream because they've blown up because people love them. Head to Walmart, get your four bar box variety pack, or go to Sam's Club, get your 13 bar box and last yourself for a week or so. Tons of great flavors, like I said, uh, double chocolate, coconut puff, cookies and cream. Absolutely incredible. You'll thank me later, Built Bar. And for all the everydayers that are out there on the grind, watching us every day, listen to the show every day, I feel you, I hear you. You guys rock. So if you were here with us yesterday, we talked about the quarterback battle. Coming up next week, we're going to have some interviews, continue talking about our live uh, watch show at the launch. So for all the everydayers, you guys are awesome. Really do appreciate it. Uh, let's get John Garcia Jr. back on. We got another commit to talk about, John. Uh, Landon Gothier, in-state. Uh, Gothier, I think, is the pronunciation. In-state linebacker. Um, another one with, with a good frame, projectable. What did you see when you are watching Landon on film? Just the comfort in space. I mean, this is – you talk about modern. You know, th this kid, Landon, works outside in on almost every sample we get from him on Friday nights. And he does so as a dual threat. And what I mean by that is he does it really well against the run, as you would probably expect a, a stockier physical player to do. But he also does so against the pass. And that is where – it should hit another level for Wisconsin fans because if you can work well in space and run and close, that's fun and, and good, and, and it'll help you against the run and, and the short passing game that has become prevalent throughout the sport. But if you could also work in true coverage, and there are some samples of him knocking footballs down 40 yards down the field, 
now you present true three down value and true assimilation into the modern game. Uh, we just talked about it with, with the other commitment of, hey, maybe he can do this in space and help out against tight ends and, and go from there. Well, now this is a player in, in Gautier who you know in space can absolutely wall off a slot receiver, can absolutely contend with a running back as a as a receiver, you know, and, and maybe one that could help you um, in a zone scheme on top of it. So that is where you, you get enhanced value with this kid. But against the run, very physical uh, leverage based player can set the edge excellent at, at hand utilization to get off of blocks just navigates the field really well and has some pop you know there's some short area explosion here within his game uh, but really comfortable in space working outside in which is it just screams modern will linebacker a, a guy you can use on every down uh, at, at different depths, even with, with real comfort on top of it. So not the flashiest get, uh, not the freaky athletic testing numbers and all that stuff that might come elsewhere. So he won't be as talked about, but that comfort uh, in space is really invaluable in this day and age, because you're going to combat Phil Longo type offenses mm -hmm. that want to go fast and they want to go wide. Uh, so this is the perfect complement to some of the bigger, you know, more conventional players that Wisconsin already had on the roster and that it continues to bring it. Yeah. I thought whoever cut up his, his highlight film did a great job too. Cause like the first clip he's dipping his shoulder pass rush. The second clip he's in coverage. The third clip he's stacking a, you know, and tackle and extending a play. And you really see the whole package there. I talked about a parallel between these two. I want to kind of talk to you about the direction uh, defense coordinator, Mike Tressel, Luke Fickler potentially going with this. They played a lot of a three, three, five at Cincinnati where you're, you have kind of more space and it feels like both of these linebackers and you hit on it are versatile. You know, they can do a lot of different things. That feels like the mold they're going towards with this defense. And they both take on blocks so mm -hmm. well, they can both set the edge in theory. These could be, you know, your edge setters on, on either side of the line, just one from depth and, and one maybe a little bit closer to the line of scrimmage. So yeah, that is so important in, in any scheme, but especially in the three, three, five, you're asking your guys to just do more because you're you're dedicating so much personnel to the back end that your 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 front six in this case really have to do more and occupy to the point where it's not a weakness because you know you, you used to play Madden or NCAA on, on on PlayStation and it's like oh West Virginia is running the 335 we're going to run it right at them right you know so that's the expectation because there's just less bodies dedicated to, to stopping it. So that means the each guy has to do a little bit more. So if you can play in space and also set the edge, it brings more value. Uh, or in Thomas's case, if you could rush the passer and set the edge, it brings more value. Or play in space just a little bit as well, it just brings more value on the front end of that. And these guys are already showing that as juniors in high school, which is really encouraging because you you hope to enhance that ability at the next level. It's not always about how do you round out your game? What do you add to the arsenal? Can you strengthen a strength and really make that your calling card on, on Saturdays where, where it matters most? I think if, if that happens with either of these two guys, they're going to get in the rotation sooner rather than later. One of the things I talked about um, with, with Landon specifically, like it feels like every other recruit in this class, and John, we talked about everyone. We've talked about Matt Toyer, the two tight ends, Steck and Booker. We talked about Heiberger. We talked about Jensen. They all feel like kind of obvious gets to me. I mean, they're they're great wins, but they're, they're players you watch on film. The measurables are there for all, really all of them. And you're like, yes, this one feels like the first player in this class. The staff has gone out. Not a not a big offer list yet. Doesn't have the elite uh, athletic measurables necessarily. It's like their first real evaluation, maybe against the grain. Um, the track record for Fickle, for Trestle, for developing, for finding, I feel like that should make Badger fans feel pretty comfortable when they go out there and pluck a guy that doesn't have a big offer list. Yeah, let, let's trust the evaluation. And look, Landon's in state too. We keep talking about how loaded the state mm -hmm. is and how rare that is. If you're going to miss, you miss on one of two things. You, you either miss on the measurables. Look, you, you miss on a guy who's just freaky athletic and, and just never figured it out. Fine. Nobody's going to fault you for that. But if you miss in, in another direction, let's miss on a high floor player within state lines that could push a pipeline. And that's exactly what, what Landon provides coming out of Green Bay. So I, I do think that that's a, a safe bet. And if there was worry from an evaluation standpoint, this green light doesn't come in April. It, mm -hmm. it comes in December or January. And you're like, oh, we got an extra spot. Let's let's throw the in-state or a bone. This is not that. This is, you know, seven, eight, nine months ahead of time 
taking an instater you feel good about from an evaluation standpoint. It's almost let's grab him before he blows up. So where it doesn't become a situation where, man, now we can't keep this guy home. Um, But look, Stanford was in there. Ivy League schools were in there. So, again, we talk about high floor players. If you got that sort of cerebral track record to to verify on the other side from from an IQ and intelligence standpoint, you like that, too. Uh, Again, if there's nothing wrong with a high floor guy. So I, I do like this take and I do like the staff trusting its gut. You have to do it. You can't look around in today's college football you'll be left behind. Uh, so mm-hmm. to have that within state lines on top of it, to me, is more the reason to take him this early, take him off the market, take him off the board. Don't let anyone else come in and, and move on from there. And la- last one here on Landon, and I, this is something that I just, I love when I watch film of, of a star high school player and he's on special teams, he's covering kicks. He also plays fullback. He first plays man down there on kick. First man down there. Yeah. Right. Does I know that's not the be all end all, but it feels like there's some intangible quality to players who are willing to just do that at every phase of football in high school level. Yeah. Look, special teams is the, is the desire phase of football, right? You just have to want it. Uh, so if you're seeing that on Friday nights from your, your, the best player on your roster, it does say a lot because no school would, would say, Hey, you've got to do this. Now the best require it at the collegiate level, but you don't see that in high school. It's not something that you're asked to do and work three phases like people did in the nineties and early two thousands. It's more about specializing in your position, but obviously Landon has uh, taken that and run with it. And he's working all three phases, including special teams, as you point out. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, when you're the best, you don't have to do that, but but he still is, and he's obviously flashing along the way, which is always nice. Yep, I agreed. All right, we're going to take a very quick break, come back and talk about uh, an electric running back prospect that Wisconsin's very high on. Uh, I'm excited to get John's take on that. That's coming up next on Locked On Badgers. All right, welcome back to Locked On Badgers. Really do appreciate everybody tuning in, as always. The everydayers, John Garcia is here, and we're always smarter and grateful for that knowledge that John drops. John, uh, running back is a big need for Wisconsin this cycle. It, it says they didn't take one last year. Well, they took um, White last year, but they, they don't have a lot of established depth there. Braylon Allen is likely gone. Ches Malusi is a senior. Uh, let's talk J.D. and Matthews. J.D. on Matthews, a, a player out of Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, good football in that area. We've talked about that before. Great football, yep. yeah. Really good football in that area. 5'10", 170, a really strong kind of Pac-12-ish offer list. What do you like about his game? What have you seen watching him on film? Well, yeah, there's a lot to like here. Uh, You talk about a guy who I don't care what the 40 says or if he runs track, I need to look it up because the first couple clips, uh, I I don't have a speed question here uh, with Matthews's game because he's he's housing kickoffs. He's taking, you know, runs 80 yards uh, on a dead sprint outrunning guys who have power five offers along the way. So now it's you flip the the perceptional evaluation than some of these other guys, you know, the South Dakota native comparatively here. So. If you're out running these guys in Arizona in the Phoenix area, it, it means a little bit more. Uh, so I do put you know some credence into that. But what I like about Matthews is it's it's not all speed. There's a lot of calculated movement skills here, and there's sneaky contact balance on top of it. You know, you look at some of the best smallish running backs. I don't know what he's listed at. You know, 180 pounds or so. They have great contact balance. Go go to the NFL. Let, let's go to the Barry Sanders, the Chris Johnsons of the world, even the Emmett Smiths, great contact balance, even though they weren't the biggest, most physical players, meaning arm tackles still aren't going to get the job done. And it also provides more value behind the line of scrimmage. I would say now, even more so than yesteryear, where everything was sort of downhill, lead blocker-esque, uh, even Wisconsin more recently than, than that. But when you're doing so – Coming from depth like you would in a spread offense, which Matthews runs in high school, and obviously he's going to run if he ends up at Wisconsin, that contact balance matters more because it helps you redirect. It helps you work against the grain, cut laterally, and and work those backside lanes that are almost required in a zone blocking scheme. So when you talk about fit and modernizing, there's a lot to like here about Matthews' game. Of course, the top end speed is – going to blow people away. He's a comfortable pass catcher. So I think that three down value is pretty easy to see. And he profiles like that conventional change of pace back. But there are some in between the tackles and decision making and vision traits here that really do pop on tape. And I think that's why schools outside of the Pac-12 footprint, you know, Wisconsin, obviously Vanderbilt, a couple others are starting to say, hey, 
there's there's a lot to like here. It's not just a, a one trick pony Pac-12 speed kind of guy. There's there's some well roundedness to his game that he's presented. Yeah, and you you hit on a couple of the things I want to talk about next. So I'm just going to fold it into here: the the pass catching ability, special teams ability. This is the type of player that, let's say, he gets. 10 touches, uh, 10 carries traditionally, but you might get five passes and two kick returns. Um, yeah. Just a weapon in the modern football. Absolutely. Gadget guy, throw him a bubble screen. I mean, split him out at slot, obviously factoring in the return game. These are the type of players that you need to, to balance things out. And, and, and think of it, you know, these defensive coordinators are locked in on personnel, right? They got a personnel guy in the box. Hey, they're in 22 personnel, two backs, two tight ends. So you're thinking, okay, run, heavy set formation. Well, a player like Matthews gives you some flexibility because now that second running back can be split out at wide receiver. G give him some jet sweeps, let him go in motion and really stunt the defense from a personnel standpoint. So he just allows you to do a, a couple more things on the field. And, and also I, I wanted to point out, Ryan, you talk about if he ends up at Wisconsin, changing that perception, this is not a back, a style of back where, where we've seen Wisconsin dabble in consistently. It's usually the workhorse in between the tackles churner that, that gets better with each carry, not the guy who's going 80 yards on one snap. So this is another great example of you know, bringing the old, but also mixing in the new even in, at a position that has always been solid and, and positive for the Badgers, uh, like running back. Yeah, last question here on Matthews, and that's a great point too, um, just modernizing the approach. Where do you see – do you have a feel on the recruitment timeline? Um, where do you see him going here just in terms of his, where his recruitment's at? He seems like he's taking his time. I haven't seen any official visits set. He's hit a few spring visits to get out of that Pac-12 footprint. Obviously, it was – recently at Wisconsin and really liked it. So I think he's going to you know, break this thing down to a top group, probably take officials to that group and, and maybe wrap it up closer to, to the start of the 23 season, which I think is good for Wisconsin because you, you you did well on, on the first impression uh, enough to probably get a return trip, whether it's an official visit or not. And Wisconsin is going to profile and present differently than the schools in that Pac-12 footprint. You know, it's going to present as something completely different, more stable. And, and look, with the schools coming into the Big Ten, it, it, it's something that you need to dip into more. That West Coast pipeline, potentially, if, if you're going to start it in any area, obviously the L.A. Metro would be first. I think the Phoenix Metro would probably be second in that Pac-12 footprint. Seattle in there as well. So this would be ideal in that regard because I actually checked before the show zero Arizona natives uh, on this current roster. So there's some added value there. That's a, that's a really fascinating point, man, with um, the PAC 12 and a bit of a state of flux, right. And the big 10 or the, the 10, obviously adding UCLA, USC, is that being used in recruiting circles at all for those West coast prospects? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's coming up more and more. We've seen, you know, your Ohio States and Michigan's always recruited California pretty well. But now we're seeing, you know, Penn State get more involved. We're seeing more schools get involved earlier within that Pac-12 footprint because it, it is so fluid. So now you can sell those recruits on, hey, you know, not only can you, you know, obviously play a little bit closer to home at some point when we play the, you know, the USC's, the UCLA's of the world, but you could also play in a conference that is going to be more associated with winning on Saturdays and playing on Sundays. It just kind of is what it is. The styles in, in the Big Ten are more reflective of, of Sunday football. So um, it's right there with the SEC in, in, in that the perceptional advantage. So selling that to that footprint is going to be very uh, prominent now and, and even more so going into the future. So your, your Wisconsin's, your Minnesota's of the world, your Iowa's are, are going to theoretically – jump into the bulk of that footprint, even beyond the state of California, which is the base, I think it could stretch further than that. And if Matthews ends up in, in Madison, I think he'll be sort of the Kickstarter from the Wisconsin angle. It's good to be one of the haves and not the have nots, my friend. It really <laughs> is. They're, they ain't going nowhere. That's for sure. All right. He is John Garcia, Jr. Locked on football recruiting insider. As always, John, uh, so, so grateful for tuning in. Really do appreciate it. For everyone that's going to be listening to this on the pod, thank you so much. Watching on YouTube, thank you so much on Wisconsin and let's talk tomorrow.